You know what? I've seen this debate go on long enough that I too would like to throw my hat into the ring. What do you think, Palpatine? Do it. That's all I needed to hear. Sure, I may be nobody. You're nothing. Yeah, that's what I just said, Kylo. But not to me. Aw, thanks. But please, let me get back to my point. A lot of people like to throw around Mary Sue without truly understanding what that term means. For example, an overpowered character isn't always a Mary Sue, otherwise R2-D2 would have to fall into that category as well, as that little legend has single-handedly saved the galaxy on numerous occasions and is arguably the true hero of Star Wars. That being said, we'll first examine the Mary Sue trope, and then take that knowledge and apply it to the four characters that are accused of being one the most. Anakin Skywalker, Luke Skywalker, Rey Palpatine, I'm kidding, Rey Skywalker, and Galen Merrick, better known as Starkiller, to establish who fits the bill. Now typically I like to use both Legends and New Canon when exploring specific topics, because there's such a wealth of lore between the two. But in order to properly make a point, I'll be sticking to strictly canon movies on this one, with the exception of Starkiller, who currently only exists in Legends. The unfortunate truth of the term Mary Sue that we must first face is that the term is often used in a very sexist, misogynistic, and downright dismissive manner that often makes women feel like a female character can never be allowed to be as epic as typical heroic male characters. Although this may not always be the case, it still happens frequently enough for it to be a problem that really needs to be addressed. I'm hoping this video, at least to some degree, can help with that. This may come as a shock to some of you, but fanfiction wasn't born in 2000s from Tumblr. It actually existed as far back as the 70s, technically even before then, and was often written by young women, at least within the Star Trek fandom. See, women have always been involved in geeky stuff. Funny enough, this is where the trope was popularized and given a name, as Paula Smith created a story that was published within her own Star Trek fanzine known as The Menagerie back in 1973. It was originally meant to be seen as a parody of the typical fanfictions that were submitted to the fanzine, but instead was taken seriously by some and became weaponized over time, which was never Smith's intention. Smith came up with the idea for a Trekkie's Tale after reading countless submissions that had young women as the protagonist, who was always brilliant, beautiful, talented beyond her peers in years, had little to no flaws, never needed saving or struggled, would have her form some immediate connection to other beloved and established characters, and would often perform some awe-inspiring moment of greatness. One story was even so bold to have the main character sacrifice herself only to resurrect herself moments later, according to Smith. These fanfiction stories inspired the creation of a Trekkie's Tales hero, Mary Sue. And yes, that is actually the character's name and why future characters would be referred to as such. She was the youngest lieutenant in the fleet, only 15 and a half years old, and was assigned to the Enterprise, only for Captain Kirk to immediately fall in love with her, and the rest of the crew to idolize her. It was later revealed that she also happened to be half Vulcan. She unfortunately passed away from illness in the end, but her impact was so great that her birthday was turned into a national holiday on the ship. Now, both the trope and its use have evolved over time, but some traits that make up a Mary Sue, or the male version known as Marty Stew, although I feel Gary Stu has a better ring to it, remain constant. We'll use these as the criteria checkboxes for our chosen protagonists. The criteria will be super talented, loved by all, without flaws, without struggle, and the story bends to their will. I will, of course, go into greater detail as we go over each of these aspects, so don't worry. Let's start with super talented. I'm kind of sweeping super powerful under this rug, but not without reminding you all about what I said earlier, which is a character that is overpowered is not necessarily a Mary Sue by default. No, when we look at this aspect, I'm talking about a character that excels in several things, sometimes even outclassing established characters that are experts in a given area, with little to no justification as to why. We'll start with Luke, son of the Chosen One, since many like to whataboutism his piloting experience whenever people accuse Rey of being a Mary Sue. With Luke, the movie gives us quite a few dialogue references, some that are deleted or extended scenes that were added back, that provide insight into his abilities as a pilot. For instance, Obi-Wan states, He was the best star pilot in the galaxy, and a cunning warrior. I understand you've become quite a good pilot yourself. We also have a previously deleted scene that was added back, of Biggs vouching for Luke by stating, I'll be right up there with you, and have I got stories to tell you? You sure you can handle this ship, sir? Luke is the best bush pilot in the outer rim territories. You'll do all right. Thank you, sir. I'll try. A major argument made against such exposition is that Luke piloted terrestrial craft rather than spacefaring ones like the X-Wing. 
The novelization not only provides a name of the craft that Luke piloted, the T-16 Skyhopper, but even went as far as to state that the controls were quite similar to the X-Wing. But we're not going to count that, just a fun little bit of information to share. The main point is that some of these skills will transfer, enough for him to refrain from crashing to the nearest ship or station. The Rebels were taking anyone they can get to bolster their dwindling numbers, and it's clear that they weren't depending on him specifically. Ultimately, he is successful, but there's something important that needs to be pointed out. We never see Luke use any advanced maneuvers or do anything that proves that he is just as skilled, if not more, than his fellow X-Wing pilots. He remains in standard formation throughout most of the attack. He also had R2-D2 as his wingman co-piloting his X-Wing. The shot he took wasn't even successful due to his talents or abilities, no. Obi-Wan directs Luke on what to do and the cosmic force literally curves his shot down into the shaft, destroying the Death Star. Of course, Luke is the one that gets all of the credit, because everyone else is none the wiser. In terms of combat, we're never provided anything through dialogue or actions to make us believe that he is a skilled fighter, other than the short amount of training he had with Obi-Wan and Yoda, and that's exactly why he gets worked over by Vader, even losing a hand in the process. Now the second fight is iffy, because we don't know how much time has passed within the movie between Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi, but outside of the movies, we're told it is roughly a few months, close to a year at best. We do know, however, that Luke never went back to train with Yoda on Dagobah, as Luke states that he hasn't seen Yoda since his last fight with Vader, so any training he did undergo was on his own. Round 2 Luke is able to hold his own much better, and eventually decides a hand for a hand before realizing the mistake he was making. That's when the Emperor lit Luke up like a Sithmas tree, and that would have been the end of our friend if Daddy didn't save the day, throwing Palpatine down the shaft. So Luke didn't even defeat the true big bad of the story. In terms of the Force, we never get the chance to see Luke truly shine or do anything all that impressive, to signify a leap in abilities within using the Force. A Force pull here, mind trick there, and let's not pretend that he didn't straight up Force choke a Gamorrean in Jabba's palace. Even with all of that, he had minimal training that we know of, therefore it makes sense that he didn't have much to show for it. So, it's pretty clear that Luke does pass the super talented test, despite what others would have you think. For Anakin, it's a little more all over the place. We already know what he will become, but the prequels still have to show us how and why. It's not long after being introduced to this child that we discover he is literally born of the Force. Not only that, but before Qui-Gon and friends even leave the planet, we're told Anakin has the highest midichlorian count ever seen. After meeting the Council, it's believed that he's the Chosen One of Prophecy. He's Space Jesus! So we're already given a pretty clear explanation a few times over as to why he's only going to get more powerful from here. So we start with piloting again. We're told that Anakin is born in slavery, and has worked day in and day out as a mechanic since as early as a child is capable of, so we're talking maybe only a couple or a few years since he's only 9 years old in The Phantom Menace. He's almost finished building his own protocol droid from scraps that we all know is C-3PO. He also built a pod racer and has piloted one a few times, although he's never successfully finished a race due to mechanical failures and to Bulba cheating. Qui-Gon Jinn takes a chance on this child, sensing that the Force is strong with Anakin. Through a combination of limited piloting skills, established technical knowledge, and a dash of the Force, he is finally able to keep the pod racer together long enough to not only finish, but also win the race in his freedom. The only maneuver we see him pull here that is out of the ordinary is when Sebulba knocks him onto the service ramp, but Anakin is able to correct his pod racer and use it to his advantage to get ahead of Sebulba, but that lead is only temporary. It's honestly a close race that Sebulba only loses because of his dirty tricks finally backfiring on him. Then we have the destruction of the Trade Federation droid control ship. What people tend to forget, or even choose to gloss over, is that the whole thing was a fluke. Anakin hid in a Naboo fighter, per Qui-Gon's instructions, only to push a bunch of buttons in an attempt to try and help Padme and her squad. This activates the ship's autopilot, but also pay attention to who is with him. That's right, R2-D2. Seeing a trend here? Nothing Anakin does is on purpose or based on his skill. When he finally does gain control of the ship, the most advanced maneuver he pulls is a barrel roll, until eventually getting hit and forced to dock within the droid control ship. Even here, Anakin is in the right place at the right time, by mistake, as his ship just so happens to slide right in front of the main power reactor. He's not even aiming for it when he hits it with a couple of torpedoes that miss the droids he intended to hit. This starts a chain reaction, he takes a straight shot back out, and gets the hell out of dodge. Jump forward 10 years with Attack of the Clones, and we don't get a chance to see his piloting ability, other than the car chase, which, although he deftly maneuvers, doesn't do anything of serious note. We also know that he has been training under Obi-Wan, and is part of the Jedi Order, since we last seen him in Phantom Menace. Jump again three more years, and this is where we get to see Anakin truly shine. This is the Anakin that we heard about in New Hope. He is an ace pilot, pulling off risky and advanced maneuvers throughout the beginning sequence of Revenge of the Sith. That's 13 years of training and experience, however, not even taking the Clone Wars cartoon series into account to further prove that point. 
In terms of combat, we again have that 10 year gap between Phantom Menace and Attack of the Clones, where we know that he is trained under Obi-Wan as part of the Order. When facing off against Count Dooku, Count Dooku is not only able to handle both Obi-Wan and Anakin, but he also disarms him. See what I did there? Anakin, despite years of training, is outclassed and dismembered by his opponent, only to be saved by Yoda. Three years later, Anakin gets his rematch that starts out as another 2v1 against Dooku, but quickly becomes a 1v1 that leads to Anakin finally getting the upper hand. He returns the favor with interest, slicing off both of Dooku's hands, before also beheading him, thanks to Palpatine's enabling. Although three years is a much shorter gap of time than the 10 that Anakin had leading up to the first fight with Dooku, you have to remember that the first fight was a lesson, to which Anakin takes his training more serious as he boasts when he's facing Dooku a second time. This is also an opponent that Anakin has experienced fighting against, at least one previous time, although it's realistically multiple times when you consider the Clone Wars cartoon, which we are not, in order to keep things on a level playing field. Then we have the legendary fight between Anakin and Obi-Wan, one that still breaks my heart to this day. There is an ebb and flow to the battle, with neither side truly overpowering the other, at least until Obi-Wan gets the high ground. It's at this point that Anakin's hubris gets the best of him, resulting in him losing his remaining arm and two legs, left to die on Mustafar. In terms of the Force, we never get to see Anakin use any abilities that stand out against his fellow Force users, despite the claim of being the Chosen One. He's also undergone training since he was 9 years old, up until he turned 22, and then continued under a new master as Darth Vader. So, although he is the Chosen One, which can be an annoying trope in itself, he never really does anything that makes him as epic as such a title would make you believe, therefore also passing the super talented test. He's pushing it with the electric engineering and repair mastery at the age of 9, but that could be due to being a child prodigy, aside from being the chosen one. Galen Merrick, aka Starkiller, will be fairly short and easy to go over, as we never get a chance to see him do anything other than just being ridiculously powerful in the Force, and he isn't even the chosen one. I'll probably have to repeat this point a few more times, but what is important to note is that overpowered does not necessarily mean Mary Sue. He has no other skills to speak of outside of the Force. We don't see him being good at building or repairing. He isn't a brilliant strategist, often being told what to do and following such orders rather blindly. He also has others do the flying for him, when not doing simple pre-programmed jumps to a desired location. Combat-wise, we know he's been training as Darth Vader's secret apprentice, since he was abducted by him as a small child. We're never given an official age as to when this happens, but, just by looking at him, I think it's fair to assume that he was 5 or 6 years old. He's 17 years old at the time of his death, at the end of the first Force Unleashed game. That means he's been training for at least 11 or 12 years, under the Chosen One. We see that Vader is not a kind teacher, and likely pushed Starkiller harder and more frequently than Anakin under Obi-Wan and the training that one receives from the Jedi Order. We then have Proxy, Starkiller's droid companion, whose sole program mission is to kill Starkiller and attempts to do so many times. All of this is done to keep Starkiller subservient, but also build up his pain, fear, and anger that the dark side is known to draw from, much like what the Emperor does to Darth Vader. Throughout the game, you are tasked with hunting down the remaining Jedi who survived Order 66, and among those that you defeat, some of them are former Jedi Masters. These fights don't often showcase Starkiller winning due to his prowess with a lightsaber, but, more often than not, due to his strength and power with the Force. Speaking of the Force, Starkiller is just something else. I mean, he pulled a Star Destroyer out of space and crashed it into Rax's Prime! Sure, he lost control of it at the last moment and nearly crushed himself in the process, but come on! That's really impressive! He also is able to catch TIE Fighters out of thin air, just to also throw that out there. Starkiller was made for everyone to live out their wildest force user power fantasy. He is undoubtedly overpowered, but nothing special outside of his command of the force. He doesn't have anything else that he's good or excels in. It's for this reason that he passes the super talented test. That brings us to Rey, who were originally led to believe was nobody, but ended up being the granddaughter of Emperor Palpatine. She was orphaned and largely survived on her own on the desert planet of Jakku. We see that she is a scavenger and has likely been one for as long as she can remember. We do see her using a speeder, but so did Luke, and we didn't count that as part of his experience then, so we won't be doing that now. Her piloting skills are only what she says they are, unlike Luke and Anakin, to where we at least have other people stating it, or showing us before making such a claim on their own. This is a problem because anyone can say anything, and we're expected to take that at face value. That's like me saying that I'm a pilot. Without anyone to speak up on my behalf, or any way of proving that to you, would you believe me? I didn't think so. Sure, the novelization states that she used an A-Wing flight simulator, but we're not provided much detail on how long she has been doing so. A simulation, however, is quite different than actually piloting a ship, but I won't deny that the knowledge and skills do transfer, to some extent. Although she is clumsy with flying the Millennium Falcon at first, 
She quickly adapts and is able to pull off quite a few risky and advanced maneuvers and strategies, outclassing trained First Order pilots. You'd never see a novice pilot, who has admittedly never previously flown a given ship, attempt to navigate through such tight corridors, let alone do so successfully. Some claim that Finn provided support, but other than shouting ideas, he didn't really help her pilot any better. On to her skills as a mechanic. Many were upset that Rey knew how to address issues with the Millennium Falcon better than the owner himself, Han. Here's the thing though, just because you own a ship, doesn't mean you know how to repair it. That's like if I were to own a car for many years, that doesn't mean I'd know how to repair it, other than changing a tire or changing the oil. Besides, we often see Chewbacca doing the repair work in the original trilogy and beyond, not Han. As I mentioned before, Rey has been scavenging for many years, so some of those skills will translate into mechanic work, at least in regards to knowing the function and importance of parts, and how to add or remove them. She also points out to Han that she's familiar with the history and changes that have been made to the ship ever since it was brought to Jakku. There's nothing here that stands out more than it should in regards to her technical abilities. It makes sense, and is fairly well showcased within the film. Her combat abilities seem to be a touchy subject. She grew up alone and survived with only her wits and staff to save her. Having to fight against other scavengers and thugs in order to survive is not a difficult conclusion to jump to without even having to mention it. Although proficient through raw experience over formal training, there is no suspension of disbelief that she can handle herself with one. Using a lightsaber, however, is a slightly different story. Yes, staff skills do translate, to some extent, into the fundamentals of other similar weapons, but not as much as some seem to claim. If this were true, then any martial artist that becomes proficient with a staff could be proficient with several other weapons, which simply isn't the case. Further training and or experience with specific weapons is required. Younglings trained with lightsaber training staffs and training sabers for a reason, because both directly translate into the use of a lightsaber, one more than the other. Don't let the name fool you though, as lightsaber training staffs were not actually staffs, but were wooden swords. When we first see Rey using a lightsaber, she's facing off against a mentally unbalanced and severely injured Kylo Ren, so there's an obvious handicap to begin with. There are a few things to consider about this battle that people seem to disregard or gloss over. Yes, he is still injured and unbalanced, but he still has several years of formal training and experience over Rey. He trained under both Luke and Snoke, alongside the Knights of Ren, from when he was 10 years old until he was 29 in Force Awakens. He is trained by two of the most powerful Force users alive, in addition to some of the most ruthless and dangerous warriors of their time. Also, he is part of the Chosen One Skywalker bloodline. Although not explicitly stated in the film, we clearly see that Kylo Ren is using Focused Rage, which is a dark side force ability that increases fighting prowess, bolstering aggression, and increasing durability in battle. Although supernatural in nature, martial artists in real life are often taught how to fight through pain, until no longer able to continue or until they've won. I hate to bring this up, as it only further demonstrates how the sequels mistreated Finn as a character, but Finn only lasted a fraction of the time that Rey did, as to where Rey won her fight, and Finn had lost and was cast aside from that point on. Finn was a stormtrooper, abducted and forced into joining at a very early age. We know that stormtroopers undergo rigorous training with melee and ranged weapons, as any military force does. This is also demonstrating during the assault on Takodana, as we see a stormtrooper wielding a riot control baton against Finn, who is wielding a lightsaber. In the book Before the Awakening, it is also mentioned that Finn performed at the top of his class in many different areas of training, but this is strictly mentioned for informational purposes and not to be taken into account during his fight with Kylo Ren. It just further proves my previous point in addition to what we see in the film of his experience. Either way, Finn is barely able to hold his own, but at least is able to get one good shot in before being taken out. We then see Kylo Ren face off against Rey. Kylo Ren has the upper hand in the beginning of the fight with Rey, but the tables completely turn, nearly in an instant, only for Kylo Ren to be defeated and disfigured. Granted, his intention was not to kill her, but he still could have incapacitated her. He could have removed a hand or arm to end the fight, capture her, and try to convert her to his side again later. I mean, she's a Skywalker after all, and it kinda comes with the territory. Rey comes from a strong force bloodline, that is without question, but she exhibits a proficiency and variety of force abilities not common amongst Jedi for such a short period of time. Her training, much like Luke's, is only less than a week, as we know by the Luke's Three Lessons line in The Last Jedi, which appear to take place over three days. The difference, however, is that Luke struggles to lift a few objects, as to where Rey has already performed mind trick, force pull, and even cracks the ground around her with enough power to frighten Luke. Rey may have believed in the Force more than Luke, but it doesn't explain her ability to command the Force in as many ways, or as well, as she does already. We also have the large pile of heavy rocks feet, but that's just par for the course at this point. We are given some explanation as to why within all three movie novelizations, but just like the other Skywalkers, we're not counting anything outside of the films, which becomes an issue in itself that I'll later discuss. Now I already know what you're all going to assume, as it appears that I have been far more critical of Rey than the others, 
but it's not I that you should blame. It's the writing of these characters. This may come as a shock to you, but Rey does actually pass the super talented test. I'm not going to lie, she comes close to failing considering she is a more proficient powerful version of Luke, but with a fraction of the context or reasoning as to why. There just isn't enough evidence there, especially if you consider the external canon sources, to tip the scale in favor of her being a Mary Sue. The good news is that the super talented criteria bleeds a lot into the other criteria, so the following ones should be shorter. So, let's dive right into the next one, Loved by All, which is only made worse when a character also happens to run into, and is almost immediately respected and are admired by, previously established and beloved main characters. Now obviously enemies and antagonists aren't going to love these characters, so that never has nor will count as a way to discredit a character's potential of being a Mary Sue. People also tend to think that Loved by All includes fans. It doesn't. The meaning of Loved by All strictly applies to the characters within the story, and only those that have encountered or have at least heard of them. We'll start with Luke, who started out as a simple farm boy, only to wind up a Republic hero and Jedi of legend. Now even though Obi-Wan, R2-D2, and C-3PO are previously established and beloved characters, this was not the case when Star Wars was first released, as it was written and filmed long before the prequels were even a thought. Aside from that, R2-D2 doesn't warm up to Luke until later, because you have to earn R2-D2's respect and affection. Which is why he tried to run away and refused to show Luke the whole message, unsure if he could trust Luke. C-3PO was subservient from the start, because he's C-3PO. He has and always will be a sub, and there's nothing wrong with that. Obi-Wan cares for Luke, as he views Luke as a nephew, and was close friends with Luke's father, Anakin. Even with Han and Leia, Luke had to earn their respect through his actions. Luke's selflessness and eagerness to help annoyed Han at first, but grew on him, even serving as a source of inspiration. Leia thought that both Luke and Han were inept upon first meeting them. Leia did warm up a little more towards Luke and Han after the rescue, but it wasn't like they were pals all around from the get-go. Luke remains a relative nobody, even among the rebels, until the destruction of the Death Star. It is for this reason that Luke passes the Love by All test, as other characters don't always give him the warmest reception, and often question his qualifications or reason for being there until he proves himself otherwise. Anakin is an easy one. Even as a kid he was looked down upon, and being labeled the chosen one didn't do him any favors. Qui-Gon Jinn may have seen something in Anakin that others didn't, but even Obi-Wan called Anakin a pathetic life form upon meeting him. Not to his face, of course, as young Obi-Wan was a savage, but not a straight up jerk. Fast forward to Anakin meeting the Jedi Council, none of them believed he was the chosen one, remaining quite skeptical and even slightly abrasive towards the child. They didn't even want to train him until Qui-Gon Jinn threatened to do so with or without the Order's blessing. The only character that was overly fond of him from the start was Padme, but I won't even get into how odd and poorly written that relationship was. That's a whole different video. As Anakin gets older, his situation didn't improve. The Council, especially Mace Windu, didn't exactly trust the Chosen One, leaving him constantly fighting for their approval, among other things. This prequel trilogy is what establishes, in a roundabout way, the beloved characters that we see later in Star Wars history, so that's out too. Nope, Anakin wasn't very well liked in general, which didn't help his fall to the dark side and eventual transformation to Darth Vader. This is why Anakin passes the Love by All test easier than any of the others. Starkiller. Vader used him. Proxy always tried to kill him. Juno Eclipse only put up with him because it was her job. This guy didn't have a friend in the world, which makes sense because he's the bad guy throughout most of his story. It isn't until he saves Juno from certain death that she starts to warm up to him. Starkiller convinces Ramco to join the rebel cause after Coda senses a spark of light within him, thinking that he could turn Starkiller away from the dark. The Alliance to Restore the Republic only trusts Starkiller due to his actions against the Empire leading up to their meeting and Ram Coda vouching for him. Starkiller later sacrifices himself to save his new friends and they honor him by using his family's crest as the symbol of the newly formed Rebel Alliance. Although the self-sacrifice and grand gesture to honor his death certainly creeps into Mary Sue territory, Starkiller still passes the love by all test because he also had to earn the respect of his peers, not just automatically gain it for being himself. Alright, to be fair, I think Finn would go all goo goo eyes for the first girl he'd meet on Jakku. It just so happened to be Rey. Doesn't change the fact though that he immediately tried to impress her and earn her affection. Seeing as how they were in possession of the Millennium Falcon, we knew Han and Chewie were coming because of nostalgia, but this further plays into the main character meets and earns the notice and respect of established and beloved characters. Han and Chewie immediately warm up to Rey, nowhere near as much as Finn, because the story has deemed him to be a side character that would only be further poorly handled with each subsequent film. Maz gives Rey Luke's lightsaber, sensing a greater destiny about her. We then see the twisted start to Raylo when Kylo tries to force his way into her mind, but it backfires. He becomes enamored by her and, rather than trying to kill her, tries throughout the movies to get her to join him instead, even falling in love with her after she fatally wounds him but heals it before it can kill him. 
Ray later meets Leia, who welcomes this random girl she has never met before, that traveled with her now dead husband, with open arms. Literally. It's when Rey lifts the large pile of heavy rocks in The Last Jedi, effectively saving what is left of the Resistance, that she becomes a big name among them. But that's understandable. She certainly makes a great first impression among Poe and the others. Then, in Rise of Skywalker, we complete nostalgia bingo by having Rey meet the king of smooth himself, Lando. Thankfully, Lando doesn't die, like every other hero from the original trilogy that she has come across in the end. Oh, almost forgot, Rey also finds out she is half Vulcan, er, I mean, is Palpatine's granddaughter, proceeds to destroy a fully resurrected and dyad juiced up Palpatine, a task that Luke and Vader failed to do, and becomes the Jedi Avatar. To wrap things up, she is adopted by the Force Ghosts of Luke and Leia Skywalker, officially becoming a Skywalker herself. I hate to break it to you all, but we have our first test failure, and it's Rey with Loved by All. She commits the cardinal sin of being a fanfiction character in canon, meaning and immediately being noticed and or respected by, even being related to, established and beloved characters. She also is idolized by all the new characters that she meets, and she doesn't often have to do much of anything, if even anything at all, for it to happen. She even made the main antagonist throughout most of the films fall in love with her. We now come to the Mary Sue criteria without flaws. Do... Do I really need to go through this one? Okay, fine, we'll start with Luke. Luke was a poor farm boy on a desert planet with dreams of space and adventure twinkling in his eyes. Remind you of anybody? He starts out as a very whiny character that ends up with more than he bargains for. He tries to rescue Princess Leia, but she ends up aiding in their escape more than Luke and Han do. He's shown not having faith in himself, or the Force for that matter, during his training with Yoda. He's too quick to action, not due to arrogance, however, like his father, but due to his need to do what he feels right. This would be great, and all kinds of heroic, except he rarely has a well thought out plan, and it usually backfires, such as Cloud City and Jabba's Palace. I wanted to include Death Star 2 in that list, but even though it wasn't super well thought out, it went surprisingly according to the plan. Well, at least the there's still good in him part, and trying to return his father to the light. He did, however, let his emotions get the best of him, almost falling to the dark side, but realized this before he made the biggest mistake of his life. Three movies worth of character growth finally snap into place, and this is where we see Luke finally mature into the legend so many know and love. So yeah, Luke most certainly had his flaws, and we watched as he worked through them and grew as a person and character until the final credits rolled for the original trilogy. Luke definitely passes the without flaws test. We could take it a step further into the sequel trilogy, showcasing how he falls back into the same hole of self-doubt, undoing his growth from Return of the Jedi, after stopping himself from trying to strike down his nephew, sending off an unfortunate chain of events. Yoda shows up to teach him one final lesson, and Luke goes back to being the legend so many know and love again. So we get his entire three movie story arc again, but in one film, and this time it's used to push Rey forward. Anakin, oh Anakin. This one pretty much speaks for itself. Please see the loved by all criteria we just went over, and that alone highlights some of his flaws. To go into detail though, Anakin always had a chip on his shoulder, something to prove. Sure, he had the title of chosen one, but rather than being humble about it and grow into it, he was very arrogant, and his hubris often got the best of him. He was very rash, but did so because he was chasing opportunities to prove himself or make himself look better. He had deep-seated issues with anger, and a fairly short fuse to boot. He was very possessive of Padme. Some would argue it was out of love, but that is a very toxic kind of love. Despite others having far more knowledge and experience, he always considered himself superior to his peers. To top things off, he fully fell to the dark side, embracing it to become Darth Vader. Anakin passes the without flaws test with flying colors. He was a deeply flawed character, but that of course made him and his fall feel so very real. Starkiller has no real will or mind of his own, at least not until the final moments of the game, doing whatever Darth Vader demands of him, without question. He's blindly loyal and naive, despite being betrayed not once, but twice throughout the original Force Unleashed game. He doesn't have much of a personality of his own, and also suffers from anger issues. But that last part is really Vader's fault, as he pretty much beat that into him. Starkiller passes the without flaws test, because even though he has a few flaws, he doesn't really have anything positive or exceptional about him, aside from his strength with the Force. Rey may appear to be flawless, but she shares some similar ones to Luke. Like her master... She often acts on impulse and emotion, with the best intentions of course, but with half-baked plans. Her percentage of success, however, is better than Luke's. Unlike Luke, however, she never doubted her connection to the Force, or the Force itself, which is why she was more successful than Luke when first using it. Unlike any other protagonist, however, she is an eternal optimist, always pushing herself and others forward. She may stumble at times, but her beliefs are never truly tested, and we don't see any major growth in her character, only in powers and abilities. I'll go more into this when we get to the without struggle test. That being said, Rey passes the without flaws test as she's similar to Luke, but with less flaws. Those flaws, however, do exist, 
and she isn't as perfect in terms of personality as those that hate her swear by. We draw ever closer to the end of this examination of characters and tropes, but this next Mary Sue criteria is an important one, without struggle. The reason why I say that without struggle is so important is because all good stories and well-written characters have to experience some form of great struggle, whether it be internal, external, or both. For Luke, that struggle is real, as he fought with himself, with the dark side, against Vader, and against Palpatine. We watch as Luke grew and became more mature, as opposed to the previously mentioned whiny kid he started out as. What helps make this journey so compelling is that he didn't do it alone. Without his mentors Obi-Wan and Yoda, or his friends Han, Leia, Chewbacca, and R2-D2, Luke would never have evolved, or survived for that matter, into the man that he is. He was inspired more often by those around him compared to those that he inspired in turn. After all, it was Leia that saved Luke, Han, and Chewbacca when they were all trapped in the detention block. It was Obi-Wan Kenobi that instructed Luke to let the Force focus his aim before taking the shot. The shot wouldn't even be possible without Han saving Luke from Vader. In Empire Strikes Back, Luke is attacked by a Wampa in the very beginning. He is able to break free from his icy prison and repel his attacker, but ends up being lost out in the middle of nowhere. Thankfully, Han is able to find and save him, as Luke was moments away from freezing to death. When Luke travels to Dagobah to train with Master Yoda, he finds his training to be far more difficult than he imagined it would be, due to the lack of faith in himself and in the Force. His lack of faith is the reason he fails to lift the X-Wing. Luke also fails the trial within the dark side infused cave, striking down the false Vader in anger, instead seeing himself in the helmet, alluding to his potential fate. It's at this time that he receives a vision of his friends in trouble. Against the wishes of both Obi-Wan and Yoda, he abandons his training to try and save his friends. Although this action may be seen as selfless to some, risking his own life to save his friends, it was actually selfish in the grand scheme of things, as Luke was ill-prepared to face off against Vader and could potentially fall to the dark side, further dooming the galaxy. Luke faces off against Vader and can barely hold his own against him, losing a hand in the process. He calls out to Leia through the Force and is once again saved by his friends. In Return of the Jedi, we are introduced to a more mature Luke, but some of his flaws still remained and his plans fall through. Thankfully, he is able to outsmart and defeat the Rancor within Jabba's palace, but fails to escape. It's not until he is taken to the Sarlacc pit that he is able to escape, but again, it's with the help of his friends and the true hero of Star Wars, R2-D2, coming in clutch with the lightsaber assist. Luke also struggles with the destiny he is told lay before him by both Yoda and Obi-Wan, that it is up to him to defeat his father. Luke, however, insists that good still exists within Vader and that he can be brought back to the light. Luke allows himself to be captured in hopes of reaching out to that light one last time. The Emperor, however, goads Luke into conflict, feeding into his anger. Luke almost gives into his emotions while fighting with Vader, before realizing that he was one step away from becoming the very evil he sought out to overcome. Luke's journey is complete. Well, after the Emperor nearly shocks him to death and he's saved by his father one last time. Facing struggles that are both internal and external, Luke most certainly struggled throughout his journey. This is why Luke passes the without struggle test. Anakin also faces his internal and external struggles as well, but most of his struggles, at least after leaving Tatooine, are self-inflicted. Unlike Luke, who has friends to support him, Anakin only has Obi-Wan and Padme. His love for Padme borders on obsession, and is literally the main reason why he falls to the dark side. His relationship with Obi-Wan is a strong one, and such a joy to see on screen. This is why it's so tragic when we have the final battle between these two brothers, at the end of Revenge of the Sith. Also, as stated within previous criteria, we see him lose fights and limbs throughout the prequel films. It's unfortunate that Anakin has become our example punching bag, but the prequels have shown us that his life is full of struggles, thus why he passes the without struggle test. With Starkiller, he's more or less Vader's puppet and struggles to earn his mentor's respect and acceptance, while also struggling to establish an identity of his own after being betrayed, used, and discarded by Vader. Aside from Juno Eclipse, who is more of an onlooker throughout much of The Force Unleashed, before eventually becoming a love interest, Starkiller doesn't really have any friends to support him. His life and death is a tragic and somewhat poetic one, as he finally has a purpose, a reason to live, but must sacrifice himself to keep it alive. Although Starkiller's struggles are completely internal, he still struggles nonetheless, which is why he passes the without struggle test. Now, a major criticism of Rey is that she doesn't have any real struggle, and I don't believe that is entirely true. Tragic backstories don't count, because that's pretty much standard hero fanfare, and what we see of Luke, Starkiller, and especially Anakin. Her internal struggle with identity, however, is one that is made apparent throughout all three sequels. She longs to know who she is, who her parents are, and is willing to go to great lengths, some dangerous, to find that answer. Although Rey does make friends, none of them really get the chance to support her and her journey. It's usually the other way around, where it is Rey that is saving her friends and allies. Even when faced with external conflicts or being captured, she ends up freeing herself, such as the mind trick, or overcoming it on her own. 
She has little to no issue learning how to use the Force. Sure, she believed more than Luke did, but this sudden jump in proficiency and use of powers is rather jarring. She even effortlessly gains and uses Force Heal, an advanced technique that not many have been able to use, and that Anakin literally killed younglings to try and achieve. If it was as common and simple as she makes it look, then Obi-Wan would have saved Qui-Gon Jinn, much like how Rey saved Kylo Ren, and Anakin never would have feared enough for Padme's life to fall to the dark side. Also, as mentioned within previous criteria, most conflicts end in her favor or with her winning. Yes, she dies destroying Palpatine, but this sacrifice is negated by Ben Solo sacrificing himself to save her, stealing her thunder. Even though Luke and Anakin struggled more than Rey, she was still not without struggles of her own, it just so happened that they were mostly internal. She also didn't require or really get support or assistance from her friends and allies to work through these struggles. So, Rey passes the without struggle test. This brings us to our final Mary Sue criteria, and it's one that can ruin an otherwise good story and or character. Story bends to their will. What this means is not that the story revolves around our lead character, as that is pretty common among all heroic tales. No, what I mean by story bends to their will is that other characters, events, and even the plot will change to best benefit the character. This can result in the loss of importance and or growth of supporting characters, since their actions or story arcs only feed into the lead characters. Not only that, but victories feel cheap and hollow, as they were pretty much handed to the character. The main character effectively becomes a narrative black hole. Looking back at everything that was said about Luke up until this point, the story and characters don't cater or constantly adjust to suit him. Han, Leia, Chewbacca, and R2-D2 all have stories, personalities, and exploits of their own that are just as much independent of Luke as the parts that help push him along. It's why so many people love these characters, not just Luke. Even Lando and C-3PO have their moments to shine, and they have the least amount of screen time. Hell, Lando goes from Judas to an upstanding general of the Rebellion in no time flat, and he's a supporting character. Luke passes the final test of story bends to their will and is not a Mary Sue, at all. Once again, I'll bring up Anakin being the chosen one, which would almost make the story bending to his will somewhat believable, but much of the prequel films revolved around characters other than Anakin. Qui-Gon Jinn, Obi-Wan Kenobi, and Padme all had sections of story throughout the prequels where their actions helped shape the story without depending on or directly relating to Anakin or his current place within the story. There are even sections of the film where Yoda and the rest of the Jedi Council are the focus. Things rarely go in Anakin's favor, and by story's end, we see him become the bad guy. Anakin also passes the final test of story bends to their will and is not a Mary Sue either. When looking at Starkiller, it's difficult to say that the story doesn't bend to his will, as it kinda has to by design, considering he's from a video game and he's the only playable character in perspective. All scenes and events that are playing out directly involve or feed back into Starkiller and his story, and we never really get to see anyone else have stories or growth of their own. I feel dirty saying this, as his circumstances are obviously different, but Starkiller fails the story bends to their world test, but ultimately is still not a Mary Sue. That leaves us with the moment of truth, the last test for the character that everyone fights each other about, Rey. Force Awakens does a great job of establishing new characters, fleshing out personalities, and giving each of them a journey and or goal of their own, or together. We are given Finn, Poe, and BB-8, but they are more than just supporting characters that feed into Rey's story, or at least this is the case with the first film in the sequel trilogy. Unfortunately, certain plotlines are introduced or at least hinted at within Force Awakens, but are pushed to the background or outright abandoned in favor of Rey in subsequent films. We sadly see Finn and Poe lose that spark, along with other character growth or arcs that are sacrificed in the name of pushing Rey. We are completely robbed of Jedi Finn, which, in my opinion, is the biggest travesty of the sequels. Disney even went hard on promotional posters, trailers, and other materials featuring a lightsaber-wielding Finn, only for him to be relegated to an audience surrogate, reacting to or questioning whatever Rey is doing by the time we get to the Rise of Skywalker. This is a major problem that the actor of Finn himself, John Boyega, openly brought up about the mistreatment of his character and the focus on Rey in a recent GQ interview. Enemies are either hindered or Rey is instantly elevated to be able to handle any threat or obstacle that lay before her. She learns Force abilities and can use them, without ever being taught how the Force works or how to use the abilities that she does during The Force Awakens. It's a common theme throughout the remaining films that an obstacle or conflict occurs, but Rey is suddenly able to use the Force to overcome it. For instance, Rey is able to resist and even turn Kylo Ren's mind probe against him. She uses a mind trick to free herself from captivity, convincing a stormtrooper to free her. She's able to lift a large pile of rocks out of the way, single-handedly saving the Resistance in The Last Jedi. In Rise of Skywalker, she knows and uses Force Heal, which is a technique neither Luke nor Leia have ever been shown to use, or even implied that either had taught her. This technique is advanced, not common, and used as a major plot device later in the film. Even the Force dyad that she shares with Kylo Ren directly involves Rey. We're told that this dyad in the Force has been unseen for generations, yet here we are. 
You can also recall my previous statements about her becoming the Jedi Avatar and destroying a fully restored and juiced up Darth Sidious, and her becoming a Skywalker after being adopted by Force Ghosts. When it comes to the test of story bends to their will, Rey fails. Too many characters are sacrificed, and too many convenient plot events and devices are used to elevate and push Rey's story forward, while disregarding much of the supporting cast or overall story. Rey may have failed two out of the five tests, but that doesn't mean that she's a Mary Sue. She's just... John C. For anyone who doesn't get that joke, Rey Skywalker is written in a way similar to that of the professional wrestler John Cena, as to where if she arrives within a scene, there are almost no stakes involved, or worry of failure. She'll win in the end, every time, like John Cena in his prime. There are certainly enough issues in her writing that give her the appearance of Mary Sue, so I can get why people try to levy such claims against her. But in the end, the title just doesn't fit. I'm sure people will be quick to try and refute many of these points, citing the novelization of the three films, and other books that go along with the sequels, but that's a major problem in itself. Nobody watching a film should have to go read the novelization of it to fill the gaps in logic and lore that are missing from the movie, especially when these gaps create plot holes or other issues for the main story. We don't have that problem with the original trilogy or prequel trilogy, and both of those are considerably older than the sequel trilogy. Why is that a problem now, when there really is no excuse for it? The sequels aren't bad, and Rey isn't a terrible character. It's just a shame that the sequels are written in a way that doesn't allow supporting characters to really achieve their full potential. It's also a shame that there was clear chemistry between Finn and Poe, but nothing ever happened. Don't believe me? Rewatch the Finn and Poe reunion scene and the jacket talk. You don't even have to pay close attention to see it. It's an even bigger shame that Finn was hyped up as much as he was, only to never become a Jedi, or even acknowledge his force sensitivity within the film. I'm sure this has been quite a ride, and I thank anyone who has stuck around for this long. I understand that the topic is controversial, but it's sometimes important to face such controversy with logic and facts, which is exactly what I tried to do. In the end, Star Wars has no Mary Sues, only strong characters with some written better than others. Let me know some of your thoughts on all of this in the comments, as I'd love to see it. I'm Anthony, and as always, may the Force be with you.